so the panel is supposedly, I suppose, I, I suppose really an important part of the implementation of psychosocial care, which is you can't do psychosocial care if you're uncomfortable about it or have your own issues or don't have an infrastructure in place to look after yourself. Because as was implied in the first panel discussion, this can be very stressful. It requires a lot of empathy. It takes a lot out of you. And um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, the wheel. In mental health care, there's been mentoring and supervision, supposedly, for a long time. And so that people can start looking after themselves when they're looking after others. And it's not just in, in psychosocial care. It's in general oncology care as well, one of the toughest specialties in which to work. So we've got a panel to discuss that, but it's really very much an open, uh, an open conversation with the whole room and people on the webcast. And I encourage your questions and comments um, so that we do this as dynamically as possible. Don't wait if you've got a comment to make on topic when, uh, the, uh, you know, when we're talking about it, just come in on the conversation. So our, our panelists are, uh, Phil, are Phyllis Buto, who is director of the Center for Medical Psychology and Evidence-Based Decision-Making at the University of Sydney. Phyllis, do, do join us. We've got these incredibly comfortable chairs here for you. So you can focus and just don't have any distraction from your lower lumbar, from your lumbar spine to um, think about it. Afa Gurgis, who's uh, Professor Afa Gurgis, who's director of uh, psycho-oncology research group at the Ingham Institute for Applied Medical Research at the University of New South Wales. Um, Mark Ryan, who is a consultation liaison psychiatrist uh, now in private practice well, at St Vincent's. Mark, to join us, um, and Associate Professor Selvin Parter, who is a gynecological oncologist at the Lifehouse and Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Please welcome our panelists. Um, Selwyn is the card-carrying oncologist, I suppose, on the, um, on the panel. A little bit of self-reflection here. I mean, what, what, what are the challenges you have faced and you, that you think others face as well that need to be dealt with when you actually take a humane approach to psychosocial care and, and really enter into your patient's world? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I mean, I think uh, the job or the um, devotion you have to helping people with oncological problems um, is very draining and stressful. Um, I think that um, you are confronted daily with people who are having major changes in their lives. Um, you're meeting people with family and friends who you get to know over a long period of time and then often, not often, but sometimes have adverse outcomes. So I think that... Um, continuing to provide a high level of care despite your involvement with patients and at the same time making sure that you look after yourself mentally uh, is one of the biggest challenges uh, that you can face really. Um, and then often I think people get so, or health specialists get so caught up in looking after patients that they often don't look after themselves. Um, and simple things like doctors not having a GP um, I, I haven't seen my GP for four years, so um, probably I'm the last one to, who should be saying that. Um, partaking in regular screening yourself. We advise all our patients to take part in regular screening. Um, when I was 50, or when I turned 50 a few months ago, the New South Wales Health gave me a special present uh, in the mail. And, um, what was it? Bye-bye, Sal. We'll see now. Yeah, see no, again. no, it's actually the bowel screening kit. So. And needless to say, that was four months ago. I'm still, it's still, on, it's still in my bathroom closet waiting to be used. Um, I know, I know, yeah. Um, the two I'm reasons surprised you're sitting so comfortably on that comfortable <laughs> seat. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there are probably two reasons for that. The first is that um, just not getting yourself around to do it. The other is having great sympathy for the... Um, <clears throat> spatula that's going to be used and, uh, you know, not really wanting to subject the spatula. Okay, okay. I don't, we don't get into <laughs> too much detail here. So, I mean, and, you know, doing a prostate screening check, it's stuff that we just do for our patients and talk to our patients about, but we never do for ourselves. Um, so, and it, so, have you got a GP? Uh, I do, yes. Um, uh, I can't remember how to contact her again, but I can if I need to. So, and it's been a while. It's been too long, probably, yeah. Um, and you know, it, it's uh, and the other, the, 
The other thing that's a problem is looking after people around you when you, when you actually shouldn't be, um, you know, because you're a medical person, people come to you all the time and say, oh, can you, can you sort this out for me? Can you sort that out for me? And you shouldn't really... You're talking just, about family and friends. Yeah, you should be just referring people to, onto their GPs, really. Mark, tell me some of the things that you've seen in health professionals that is kind of avoidable or need to be dealt with that people run away from. Well, I suppose um, being a doctor or sorry, in being a doctor or working in the area requires a certain level of intellectual and emotional capacity, and most of us are probably, in that sense, prone to overworking and burning out, and um, so. Uh, we'll often manifest that in a range of different ways. We may do what most of us do and just focus on the physical exclusively. Um, and that's apparent in hospital settings when um, the patient might start to disclose about their fear of dying and the nurse will take the temperature or check on their bowels. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that um, we, we show up in um, sleep disturbances, trouble relaxing, our mind gets over busy and jammed in that state and uh, we start to to manifest um, some uh, anxiety or we're physically tense, we can never relax, we start to use alcohol or some uh, self-prescribed medications. And as we start to get more and more distressed, um, we find work more and more burdensome and so we start to drop the ball even more in terms of caring or compassionately engaging with patients. And uh, um, <clears throat> if you look at it beyond that, so we tend to get a bit stuck on the narrative discourse level of um, our experience. and. One of the interests I have these days is in looking at uh, the other bits uh, that underlie or contribute to or correlate with our subjective experience, and that is things like how the brain's organising itself or what's happening in our sleep or, and how we can regulate those sorts of things. So um, <clears throat> there's a number of ways of looking at the problem, uh, and it goes beyond just developing the standard skill sets of um, having a warm bath or having communication skill strategies or knowing how to slow your breath that sort of thing, um, and uh, it probably depends on, I guess, perhaps some of, something of an exposure to these different ways of thinking about things, some different ways of understanding what's going on, and also then finally um, having a clear sense in our own mind of why, what we're doing and why we're trying to do it and how we might go about doing that in terms of our interactional behaviours, and um, that, uh, it helps to have that clearly in one's mind, and I guess they're some of the things that I think aren't often closed or, or at least articulated formally and informally and, in, and interactionally in, in the healthcare system. There's such a focus on the various outcomes and other bits and pieces of the process that uh, I guess some of the detail um, gets lost in the, uh, in, in the way the whole system processes things. And perhaps the, you know, I can flesh out more of this as we go along and uh, um, you know, relevant questions come in as well. I just want to comment it's on the figure. So, 50, 80 odd percent of people in this room um, have a GP. Uh, and I don't think there's that too many medically qualified health professionals in this audience. Mm -hmm. So, I suspect if it was doctors, you know, from the doctor's audience, we'd be down in the 10, 20 percent range mm -hmm. um, in terms of people who've got a, a general practitioner. So, this is a very healthily focused um, audience here. Um, and, of course, a high percentage of people do not have clinical supervision. So before I get on to Apple and, uh, and um, Phyllis, Mark, talk to me how supervision works in psychiatry. We'll come to psychology in a minute with Phyllis, but in, Apple, but in, in psychiatry, how does supervision work? Yeah, I think, um, well, I personally don't have supervision, um, but... Um, do you have a mentor still? Uh, I have mentors in the new area that I'm working in. Um, so any new sort of skill set or understanding I try to acquire, I'll, I'll certainly engage in appropriate supervision, but that's usually around technical focus. M my sense is that uh, most of the supervision focuses exactly on um, those sorts of more professional performance details and less um, on... So it's technical <laughs> rather than non-technical? Yes, say. I think so, and, and doesn't focus on, you know, um, uh, the subjective experience or issues around self-care in, in an adequate sort of way. Uh, at least that's my experience. And, can, um, can I just ask, can I reformulate a question? Can we put up a new question for polling? Is that possible? Without typing it in, just to just get the answer, so yes or no, is that possible? No, it's not possible. 
So let me just ask for a hands up. So this is gets rid of anonymity. So now we're now we're in. Um, so a lot of people don't have clinical supervision, but you might have interpreted clinical supervision in the same sort of technical way that Mark just did. How many of you feel that you've got somebody in the system who's there that you and it's designed and that person's designed to be there that you can go to with non-technical issues? In other words, if you've got an emotional, psychological, or just a debrief to occur, that you've got somebody that you can go to in the clinical setting. How many would have that? My goodness. That's impressive. Very impressive. Good. OK. Afif, where, what perspective do you bring to this in terms of the research base so while since you've been more clinically focused? Yeah. Um, I, I guess from a research base, we we know that some of the things associated with a higher level of burnout are things like um, not having sufficient and adequate backup to go on leave, for example, which is a very sort of basic and fundamental way that sometimes people can just shut down and relax and, um, you know, take a bit of time out. And, um, you know, for example, I can speak about a very close uh, oncologist colleague who's recently gone on extended leave because he had to take it. <laughs> he'd accumulated so much. Um, and he'd, he really had relaxed quite a lot. But by the time he got back, systems that he thought he had put in place to, you know, have people screening his emails, dealing with them, etc., had really broken down and hadn't happened. So, you know, rather than coming back, you know, truly refreshed and thinking, OK, I'm ready to kick start again, um, having to deal with a huge backlog of things that hadn't happened while he was away. So thinking about a system that can perhaps support people to do things like take leave, for example, to be able to participate in um, various things like communication skills training, for example. You know, as a researcher and having a number of clinical colleagues, um, I know that some of the meetings we have together are really about, um, you know, a little bit of that just blur, <laughs> just sitting down and actually just talking about things that aren't necessarily about the research projects. And I think having opportunities, uh, whether they're informal or formal, of being able, and Jane referred to it a little bit earlier where she said she had, you know, people waiting outside her door for her for those sorts of sessions where she thought she might have a hard time of it. Um, I think those are opportunities that we can all create and help each other in some way. Good. Well, I guess a couple of points. I think one of the things that we found consistently in all our research on stress and burnout with oncologists is that they are always high on, on exhaustion and they say yes too often to requests. But the thing that keeps them going is a really strong sense of meaning and purpose and value in what they do. And I think that's true of oncology staff um, overall. And it's when you lose the sense of meaning and value that you're in real trouble. So, you know, people who are in positions where they, they are not feeling appreciated or not valued or, or they uh, lose sight of the value in what they're doing can be really vulnerable. And the other thing um, that we've learned is that dis despite the sort of pressures and the difficulty in keeping a balance between work life and home life, what really gets people stressed often is conflict with other colleagues in the workplace. And, and actually, if you can build up a really supportive environment where people um, celebrate with each other, and uh, commiserate with each other when yet again we, you know, you don't get the grant, or, or somebody doesn't do as well as you had hoped they would, um, and work and and, in, and inspire each other. Uh, that is the sort of environment where people cope well. Um, and the cases of real stress and burnout that I've seen have often really been around unresolved conflict in the workplace. So I think that's something that we need to keep working on. Mark, talk to me about vulnerability and how you identify it in yourself and in others who might need help. Um, well, Just pull that really close. Yes, OK. So um, I think um, one of the vulnerabilities, of course, is this the nature of who we are and uh, that leads us to getting into this sort of profession, I suppose. Um, and that usually means we're usually uh, revved up um, and uh, fast-forwarding and uh, 
have a lot of energy and um, like the challenges and tend to take on more and more challenges. And some of us probably have trouble saying no because we're a little bit more compulsive than, than the next person or, or, or the average person. And all of those things um, bring a, a sort of a personal or individual vulnerability. And then additional vulnerabilities that relate to that might reflect the fact that we've, we've failed to uh, get an understanding or develop adequate skill sets in just regulating our arousal. Uh, that might include things like looking after our sleep, knowing, knowing how to regulate that, um, knowing how to regulate our inner reptile. And inner then, reptile? Our inner reptile, yes. Yeah, someone's reshifting uncomfortably thinking uh, of yeah. his FOBT here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and, uh, and I suppose then the demands of the system... Um, so, no, no, I'm serious. Inner reptile, just to... Uh, oh, sorry, inner reptile. Okay, so really I'm referring to um, the tendency that... Uh, the, 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 the sort of in, inherent reflexive uh, physiological systems that activate us to into the fight, flight, or uh, other arousal mo related arousal modes to get us through the day, to prepare us to go out of bed from sleep, to take the uh, on the challenges of work, to deal with the stressful patient or the multiple competing demands of the day. So you know, like uh, we, to, to to perform all those tasks requires an increasing level of arousal, and some of us are. Uh, better and not so good at uh, regulating that, and some of us have brain. I mean, you're talking about arousal. You're talking about your sympathetic nervous system being That's at a high level, yeah. and you're just on all the time. All the time, and some of us, I think, have brains that that uh, bias us towards being on as a set point, and then it just gets worse. And then um, we we can make it worse by not sleeping or using alcohol or not having effective ways to regulate that. And then, like Phyllis has mentioned, th there's a key variable in, in um, being clear about our values and having behavioural manifestations of those values. And uh, there's often not a lot of discussion about uh, that aspect of our work. Of, there's probably a more individual focus, but perhaps one way of institutionally addressing that is to have a clear set of um, or opportunities to state one's values and how one would behave to express those values. We've got a question uh, come in, and please tr put your questions in through the app or uh, come through the mm -hmm. microphone. Would any of the panel members care to comment on system barriers to self-care? What barriers to good self-care are created and maintained by the system? Selwyn? I think um, one of the major barriers is I think employees are, are not expected to have problems. Um, I think employers think you're machine-like, and maybe that's changing with time. But an employee who admits to mental difficulties at work becomes a problem for his or her supervisor, and it's uh, an added level of stress in their life, and they don't often want to take it on because most medical supervisors, managers, are, are often not trained as managers or supervisors. They're just senior medical people who just happen to be in the same institution over many years, and then uh, difficult, find it difficult, they avoid confrontation, they avoid tackling difficult personal issues. And they're as burnt out as the rest of the And they're as burnt out as everyone else. So the last thing they want to be is burdened by someone else. So I think that's the, that's the biggest drawback. I think the issue of mental health um, is being highlighted increasingly in the last few years, and hopefully that will change. But at the moment, I think that's a major barrier. And while people may have access to clinical supervision or some kind of supervision at work, is that a system-based thing where you are forced to talk to someone who's nominated on your behalf, or do you feel comfortable talking to that person? And often people don't want to talk to someone who they don't necessarily like. So, you know, um, I, have, I, have, I have patients or I have people at work who say, I'd rather go speak to a friend next door rather than speak to someone nominated to be my supervisor at work. But it's also an issue about the um, sense of personal shame or self-belief of inadequacy if you're putting your hand up and saying, I'm not coping. So a lot of people will clam up because of that. And, and often then it becomes a case of how you actually sell the idea of what you're trying to offer in terms of support. And you've got to be quite strategic about how you do that. And that's part of the sort of paradigm shift that may be necessary to address the, the notion of work stress burnout both at an individual and institutional level. And I, I think there's a, a couple of issues with systems. One of them is time, and I think Australia's not too bad at this, but I've come across um, oncologists in other countries who are expected to see a patient every 12 minutes, and if they don't, they get in trouble with the admin, you know. And that sort of forced throughput 
um, which just doesn't give you time to reflect and recover and think about what you want to do next, I think can be very stressful. The other thing uh, that system-wise can be important here is the attitude towards medical errors and um, whether you've got a culture of open disclosure and support around errors or whether people feel a sense of secrecy, shame, etc., when they're not happy with what's going on or they see a practice that a, another colleague is, is doing which they're not happy with. And I think that culture can engender a lot of stress and strain. So, and finally, I think um, sometimes there are indices whereby people are judged by things that really aren't a lot under their control. In, in my area, for example, you're often um, judged by how many grants you get, mm. which you can contribute to by trying to write good grants, but it's largely out of your control. Um, so it's important to have indices whereby you're judged that are under your control. Um, so I think there's a number of things that systems can do to help you. Oh. Yeah, I was going to comment about time as well, because I think that's a really big factor where um, you know, there is a very high patient load and the, the hours are being stretched in both directions and, you know, often people are expected to be at a meeting at seven in the morning and another one very late at night because that's when executive can come, for example. And, um, you know, while e-health is fantastic also, you know, if you've got email, if you've got Zoom, if you've got Skype, whatever, you're also expected to be accessible much more. So. Um, I think sometimes it's a real balance trying to just step back from that and saying, okay, well, I need my space and I need to set some boundaries in a system that sort of makes that a bit challenging at times. It can be hard to do. Do you want to make another comment? John? Yeah, no, just taking, um, taking the step of medical error and error reporting further. Um, as the surgeon on the panel, that's particularly prevalent in, in surgical oncology. Um, the consequences of what you do are profound, and um, you're often judged by, uh, by um, negative factors rather than positive. Oh, you could have done 500 cases, but the two patients that didn't go well is the one that's highlighted through numerous committees and sentinel events, and everyone gets excited and so, about it. And after a, bad, after a complicated case, you've got to get up the next morning and do another set of... Exactly, another, another and that's, that's not fair on the next person you're going to see. And also it becomes particularly difficult in the era of training where you have to train people and bear the consequences of their, of their problems. And it often is, I think in this era, it's inhibiting training because people are less and less keen to treat complex procedures to junior people because the consequences of making a mistake are so profound. I want, sorry. I just wanted to say that I, just, I once went to a conference where there was a session titled Operations I Wished I'd Never Started. And I thought that was fantastic because mm. it, it really was about That's the culture. That's the ones that do go badly. Exactly. Yes. There was one yesterday, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to lie down and talk to us about it? <laughs> Which is actually what I want to explore now because one of the things we skirmished with this morning was the issue of somebody raises something, it's a patient, but it could be a colleague, and you don't know what to say next. And it's the role of the debrief. So, you know, you watch the Hollywood movie and it's focused on catharsis. You have this catharsis and then the world is a better place when you've actually dug these distant memories up and you regurgitate them. I grew up in Glasgow where there's a phrase, SWT, which is keep your shit wired tight. And the question then is, what, what, you know, you talk about people who come to the point of not coping. Well, that's probably a failure of the system if you're not coping. But then what's the pathway to not coping? And is it talking all the time, being encouraged to debrief? Because in the trauma area, that's exactly what you don't do. There's good evidence that it causes harm to debrief. So you could actually be reinforcing bad memories, making people worse by this feeling that you've actually got to talk. And we do it to our patients as well. So we force, we're in the clinic and we're psychosocially focused and we want to encourage people to talk. It could be making them worse. What's this balance, particularly with your colleagues? I'll start with Phyllis, then I'll go to Mark, and then come to Alan. Well, <coughs> I, I think it depends on how you talk. Um, you know, I, I certainly think that um, often when you do discuss a problem with someone else, you can put that little bit of distance between yourself and the issue, and instead of blaming yourself, you can recognise it as something that is a challenge for everyone. 
and uh, that is actually helpful often to other colleagues to hear that there's a challenge in that area. Um, and together you can um, talk about some potential solutions. So, so it's pragmatic and narrative based rather than digging deep into your emotions. Yes, that's right. And it's also acknowledging that um, this is a shared problem. It's, it's very rare that there's anything in life that, that other people haven't struggled with and are relieved to know that you struggle with as well. So I, I think in most instances, you know, talking about those sorts of issues gives you that little bit of distance that makes it easier to deal with. So in many ways it's problem solving. Mark? Um, I think narratives can be a problem and we overvalue our, our storytelling and our logical, rational, conscious analyses and neuroscience shows us quite clearly that uh, our attributions tend to be wide at the mark, although we might feel smug that we've made them correctly, but we tend not to. So my, the approach that I've evolved over time is to hear the story, um, um, help them clarify their attributions and then the next step, and the most important part in my view, is then to help them uh, regulate their arousal around all of this. And as you shift gear and adjust your arousal level, the whole perception of the problem and the, uh, the context starts to change. And so, so it's a cognitive behavioral approach in many ways? Um, no, more sort of psychophysiological um, to, so you sort of shift the deck chair to a different perspective by helping someone to understand and reduce their arousal. And as that happens, then the perception will change and their, their narrative content will tend to change as well. So it's uh, perhaps sort of um, altering the way the horse and cart are put together um, and perhaps to some extent um, minimising or devaluing the, the importance of um, narrative, which, which stands uh, perhaps against the, the current of um, perhaps how we tend to think about it. Doesn't that contradict what Phyllis just said? A little, but, but not, not completely. Um, um, so... Um, the, the, the idea that the discourse and the narrative and the interaction is, um, is what is fundamentally soothing or helping is, uh, is perhaps what I'm I, mean, I think Phyllis's point was that by, if you've got a problem, mm. you don't know how to solve it, it's creating arousal, mm. talking to others about how, how to solve it, yes. also relieves the psychological burden as well. I mean, that was your core point. I, I, and also helps you to see it as a, as a wider problem than just yourself. Kind of normalises it. Bellwind? Point on this one? Uh, I, think, I think one of the things people around who, who work closely together could probably do, and I think gets done, is that from a surgical point of view, again, because that's, that's my field, if someone has had a, a complication, is for people who work with them to go and actively talk to them and say, uh, how, what happened yesterday? How did it go? You must be feeling really upset about X and Y. And I think if you approach someone who wants to talk, and you know, in, in my field, and you give them the opportunity to talk, they will quickly tell you whether they want to talk or not. So, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like are you okay day? You know, it's, it's, it's helpful for people around you to just say, are you okay or what's going on? I think it's very simplistic, but it's, then it's, the onus is placed on the person having the problem to decide whether they want to share or not. Oh, I was going to say, I think it is important to ask, are you okay? But I think it's also, I think the onus is on us all that if we're seeing that there is, uh, the person's behaving differently or they look a bit, you know, like they're not coping, I think it's important to raise it in a way. So be proactive in raising it. And I'm, you know, I tend to be quite pragmatic. So thinking, yes, let's talk it through and get the emotions out, etc. But what can we learn from that that we can apply to the next time this might come up? So thinking about problem solving, etc. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kim Pearce from Cancer Council New South Wales, um, but also standing here with two hats. So through New Cancer Council New South Wales, we're delivering the Telephone Support Group program, which has been talked about today, and the Connect program. So we have a responsibility in Cancer Council funds supervision for us. So that is provided, and if we can't commit to those supervision sessions, then we can't stay with the program. I mean, it's not quite as black and white as that, but it's there for us. So making it available to enable us to, and we do group supervision, um, to sit in a group session 
where we are encouraged to talk about our experience with the participants in our support groups, the patient's experience and the impact on ourselves. But also my other hat outside is as a counsellor and psychotherapist and for my commitment to uh, the, uh, the Counselling Association of Australia. If I can't tick the box to attending supervision, then I can't con continue to practice. But I, and I might have missed something, but I'm not hearing that being named for clinical practice of providing counselling and psychosocial support. Well, I think that what we heard was that the supervision is very technical and not the sort of supervision that you're talking about, really as structured. It's much more informal. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I, I think it often is, although I, I agree that um, for psychologists, at least, the norm is to have supervision. Mm -hmm but I think that's not the case for a lot of oncology professionals. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that even though there are services available in hospitals to support staff, there's a sort of, that stigma of going and seeking help can still be there and people are reluctant to take it up. So having, having it really be uh, core to the professional practice is really important. Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that question. A question um, online. Values have now been raised in both panel discussions. Are we getting better at living our values in our work lives or are things getting worse? Selwyn? Um, this is going to be opinion based rather than <laughs> research based. Yeah, that's hence my pause. Um, I mean, I, I think we all strive for similar values. Um, I don't think that um, the ability of or different people have markedly different values. We want to live a good life, provide our patients with the best level of care, and at the same time, not, not neglect our family. Um, and, at this, and make sure your practice is ethical, evidence-based, and that it is in keeping with what is done nationally and internationally. Um, how we achieve them is a, probably a different issue. I think um, each person sets different emphasis on different values. Uh, and sometimes the value of work is probably overshadows the values of the rest of your life. And the question is, how do you, how do you balance that? Um, I hope that was vague enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mark? Um, I think there's lots of pressures on, increasingly so, on uh, our capacity to, to behave and manifest our values. And they come in all sorts of different ways, both um, like the, the pressure to see a patient every 12 minutes or the outcome, the incredibly severe outcome focus that uh, perhaps is increasingly imposed, um, and a whole range of other things. Well, hold on a second. You work at St. Vincent. St. Vincent's has got a very explicit set of values. It's got the mission. Doesn't that help? Um, no, not in my case. <laughs> I've, um, they, they talk a lot about compassion, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily always manifest in, in its uh, style and behavior although I'm sure they'll give lip service to it. I think there's a difference between um, articulating the values, like t talking the narrative, and actually behaving it. So my emphasis is always on the behavioural manifestation of those values. How would I behave in this situation, in this context, to manifest those values that I espouse to? And I think that helps provide a, a behavioural sort of set of indices by which we can... Um, keep ourselves on a, on a particular focus. And, and they can become increasingly a more helpful way to judge ourselves or assess ourselves than um, sustain our self-worth and belief than perhaps some of the more externally imposed um, outcome values. I, I think there's nothing more grounding in terms of value than um, contact with patients. Um, as a researcher, when we have consumers involved in our research and they tell us how important it is and we go, oh, I'm so glad that it really is important and that uh, really keeps you going. So I, I think that the patient contact is incredibly important in keeping you grounded in what's really important. I think... Right. Just while we're talking, is there anybody in palliative care here who would like to make some comments? Because you probably confront some of these issues on a day-by-day -day basis more than any others. Um, so if you do want to make a comment, please come up and do so. Half of you have someone to say? Um, I, I think the issue of values, um, there's a lot of shared values as well. So I think if you work in a, I think what your team looks like can have a very big impact on, you know, how well you cope with 
um, your environment and, and um, being able to deliver your outcomes, etc. And I think if your team has a shared value of, okay, we, and I'm in research, so I'll speak from a research perspective rather than seeing patients, although I totally agree with, with Phyllis's comment. I think um, having people who are on the ground and patients and so on who are involved in our work make sure that we are quite grounded and that we're doing highly relevant work, etc. cetera. Um, but I think sharing team values around you know, working hard, delivering high quality outputs, not cutting corners where that's, you know, shouldn't be done, etc. But also just being able to take the time to shut down so you're not necessarily doing emails at the weekends, you're not expected to do that. Um, and if you're going to be doing that and coming back to work Monday exhausted, well, you know, perhaps we need to rethink that. My team's sitting out there, so I'm kind of eyeballing them. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's that philosophy of, of we work, we work at our best, we work really hard, but you've got to think about just having some time down as well. Yes. Thank you. I'm an operational manager of a cancer support centre, and I wanted to say that in the first year of my employ, I did a huge amount of overtime, then I woke up. We do have um, clinical supervision regularly, and um, I just wanted to say that I do feel that it's important for people in positions like myself to actually educate um, hospital administrators in what is appropriate um, for people working in oncology. Um, and as recently as yesterday, I was talking about the fact that we were expected to take three weeks leave at Christmas and have just one week off the rest of the year. And, um, Administrators need to understand that working in oncology, that just isn't going to work. Uh, you need to have more frequent breaks than that. And the other point I just wanted to make is that, that there are some very simple things that can perhaps be put in place in the workplace to actually assist in self-care um, that might sound like they're very trivial and small, but you know things like a, a weekly morning tea where your staff all get together and can debrief with each other. Um, just over a cup of coffee, and then when we lose patients, which we regularly do in our cancer support centre when they die, we take 15 minutes with a cup of coffee in our little meditation garden just to acknowledge those people, um, because otherwise, you know, things just come and go and we carry on with our work and we don't actually sit down and, and reflect on the sadness that we might feel. So that just builds a bit of resilience in our workforce. Um, uh, and it's just some simple little things that we do for self-care. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from online. How does a health professional maintain his or her mood state at a constant with patients one after the other? For instance, if you give bad news to one patient and the next is good news, does this bring a different level of a challenge for this? Important issue in communication. I, I do think that before a bad news consultation, it's really important to be able to take five minutes to take a deep breath and uh, think about what you're going to say and um, prepare yourself um, as well as having five minutes afterwards or longer to, to have another deep breath and perhaps have a word to a colleague. Um, and if you are going straight from one person to another, I, th I think that's really challenging. And that's true for all health professionals. And I've, I've had interesting comments, for example, from interpreters in the health system who uh, go from sometimes interpreting for a, you know, a child with a cold <laughs> to uh, into a bad news consultation with very little preparation, very little experience. And I think we really don't care for some of our staff like that in inappropriate ways. So yes, having, having that time and um, acknowledging particularly the bad news consultations, which do take a toll. So when you work in ovarian cancer, so... Yeah, yeah, I do. And I think one of the things is it's often expected or patients often present to you in, in, in a group when they're expecting bad news would support people. And I find it very, very challenging and I think it shouldn't really be done that the doctor is there by himself. I think you should have members of the team together with you to kind of break the news together. I think a one-on-one -on -one session with a patient breaking bad news when the patient has emotional and physical support around them and the, the doctor doesn't, it sounds pretty weak, I know, but it's much easier to have at least two people, a nurse consultant, uh, someone else, two treating doctors, to kind of 
share the, the news that you're giving the patient. I, I find giving bad news myself personally alone very, very challenging. And how do you deal with, you, you know, 10 minutes later you're going to have to see another patient? Yeah, I mean, uh, people would expect you to give the next patient uh, your best, but I don't think that really happens in clinical practice. You're, you often, patients often perceive that you look a bit down or you feel a bit different or you're not as lively as you used to be because we're human. So we can't just go from breaking bad news to bursting out laughing. Um, it just doesn't happen. Um, and the fact that we are is good because that's what patients expect of us. They expect us to be human. How do we, how do we deal with it? I, I don't think there's an answer really. I think it's taking time off is important, but if you want to see a patient every 12 minutes, then that's one patient gone. Um, uh, but having people around you, I think, and breaking the news together and then having an opportunity to talk to the group without the patient afterwards to kind of share the, you know, the whole experience, not in, not in a positive way but in a debriefing way is probably helpful. I mean, there's a whole sort of 120-year um, literature in psychiatry about psychiatrists maintaining a distance and not getting too caught up. Um, and it's also one of the criticisms of psychiatry. Yes, psychiatrists can often uh, and rightfully be criticised for their absolute lack of, com of, em of compassion and empathy. I think it's, I think it's um, a couple of points... That Which is partly to protect, partly a self-protection mechanism as well. I mean, it's couched in the terms of it's so that I you know, don't fall in love with the patient transference and all that sort of stuff, yeah. but it's really a coping mechanism, isn't it? Yeah, self-protection, and I guess um, that's the, what the literature suggests in all, all areas of medicine, including, of course, oncology and palliative care, is that that detachment is part of coping when you're starting to burn out. I think um, the other perspective is, of course, that you can't control your moods. You can surf them. Um, and the aim is often to catch that bias we tend to have that's implicit in a lot of the paradigms that uh, if you're feeling certain things and there's something wrong or unacceptable or bad about that and you've got to get rid of it and you've got to get rid of it before you can feel good and do the next task at hand. And there are other ways of approaching that where you can surf that and still move on to the next task having um, processed or regulated the arousal that goes with that negative or distressing emotion in the first instance. And uh, the other thing, of course, is that you know, when we interact with patients, our brain uh, arouses in ways that uh, help us understand um, the patient's experience. So the same parts of their brain that are light, lit, up, uh, lit up in our brain as well. And it's about having that sort of uh, executive, perhaps detachment, meaning executive as in prefrontal attachment, detachment that allows us to experience that and, and locate it, its source and uh, understand its uh, it's an implication for understanding the person in front of us. And the other thing And then is, the patient walks out and thinks you've just been an automaton and you haven't got anything out of the consultation. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, if, if, you, if your mirror in your own is presumably working properly, you're, you're reflecting that uh, in your facial expression and body language. And, and often, it's, if you pay attention, you'll catch yourself literally mirroring the person in front of you. Um, and uh, I suppose the other thing that I keep coming back to is that the, the key sort of to, to surfing this is always to know and understand your own physiological arousal and what, what that means and have a range of tricks and strategies for regulating that so that uh, you get dumped by that big shore break and you're able to get up and surf the next wave that comes in. And I, I do think that communication <laughs> skills training, which I'm a proponent of, is very helpful as well. And in fact, uh, one of my colleagues, I'm not sure whether she's here, Jo Shaw, did some interesting work for her PhD where she attached um, uh, monitors to doctors that looked at stress indicators um, as they gave bad news. And she found that um, the, the perhaps less experienced doctors uh, would, would get aroused when they knew they had um, bad news to break. They would delay giving the bad news. Their arousal would increase. They would delay again because it was too horrible to contemplate. And by, at the end of the consultation, they, they might blurt out the bad news. And they remained aroused for many, many, um, in, you know, for, for a long time after the consultation. Whereas the more experienced um, clinicians had an initial arousal but got the bad news out quickly um, and then had an opportunity to work with the patient around how they were both adjusting to that. And by the end of the consultation, their arousal had gone right down again. 
So I think that uh, by by l learning how to doing the right thing helps. Do, yeah, doing the right thing does help in terms of arousal and in terms of ongoing stress. One question online is um, from online or Q and A question uh, is. Is there anything to be learned from any other industry in this area? Does anybody do it better that we could learn from? The Buddhist monks, of course, would proclaim they could. <laughs> but apart from living in a monastery and eating mung beans, is there anything else? And meditating 24 hours. Well, the mindfulness meditation is not, not a, not a non-trivial part of all that. Mm. I, I think the police and the fire, fire people um, are quite good at recognising trauma in their um, staff and organising sy systemic, you know, debriefing. I'm not, I'm not sure whether we can learn from but them. But that makes them worse, doesn't it? Well, uh, I, again, I think it's the way that you do it. Although my experience of um, those sort of personnel is that they're often ostracised and marginalised within their, within their work context when they... Um, present or go off leave with um, so, those so maybe we're, we're the model professional group rather than Probably, looking yeah. somewhere else for a change certainly not the airline industry who well, I wonder about um, the value I mean certainly when we did the COSA survey some years ago now one of the recommendations we made was for screening um, you know with, with a one item question that can tell you who's at risk of um, burnout so that systems are put in place for those people early on. Um, now, I, I don't know that anybody actually systematically does screening with, uh, you know, a, a one-item question or anything else, but I wonder about the value of that. So rather than, you know, we talk about doing it with patients, you know, collecting patient reported outcomes so that we can identify early distress, early unmet needs, be able to address them, but why would we not do that for health professionals as well? rather than waiting to the crisis point when someone is in a heap and they're virtually sent away on leave to have time off or, or worse. Um, so, so, just putting it out there. Yep. Um, one person, we're getting towards the end, but let's just, um, and if there are any questions that you really want to ask, now is the time because we're going to close soon. Uh, we opened a can of worms around the impact on staff burnout. And we haven't really examined burnout as a concept that closely of egos and bullying in the health professional profession. This is a significant issue also in errors in practice due to lack of confidence. You know, close examination of the workplace. Selwyn, I'm sure, sure in your training you worked in pretty, you know, everybody's worked in toxic workplaces. Our surgeons have had um, not, not much good press on bullying and workforce bullying, as you know. Um, it's but it's the College of Surgeons, not, 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 not OBGYN. Oh, yeah, sure, I agree, yeah. I, th I think the problem with egos and bullying in the workforce is that it becomes particularly prevalent around medical error reporting, and that's giving people fodder to attack you. And the way the processes are carried out with medical errors, despite people saying it's you know, de-identified and nobody needs to take this personally and stuff, you have often a person who's made an honest mistake was then vilified. And if there are personalities in the department who actually want to use that as ammunition, it becomes a, a huge problem. And then people, people take it from being a constructive thing to a completely destructive thing. And that's where bullies and, and ego personalities manifest. If you've got an, an ax to grind with someone, if they've made an, made an honest mistake, that's the time to get your it's possibly one of the biggest systemic issues that if you've got a toxic workplace with bad leadership, that's going to lead to all sorts of psychological issues with staff and poor patient care, and there has to be ways of dealing with that that are safe and a huge issue. Yes? Uh, Kath Adams, clinical psychologist. Um, I was just wondering, are we looking at it the wrong way? We have good evidence that shows that we have relatively high levels of burnout within our workforce. We recognise that it's a toxic environment. We recognise that our supportive administration isn't necessarily always that supportive. Instead of looking at identifying the people who are burnt out or even at higher risk of burnout, should we just be routinely providing supportive education for our staff and opportunities within their routine in services about things like resilience training or mindfulness training or identifying 
what are my skills that keep me well in the job? Just trying to provide some preventative support for the staff rather than you know, trying to turn the Titanic once it's already hit the iceberg. Can I ask you a question? Is it really in the end about skills or is it knowing yourself? And I mean, I, I asked Mark about vulnerability, but I mean, there's quite a good literature on vulnerability. You know, if you've had a divorce, a death in the family, uh, you know, multiple traumas in your own life, that does make you very vulnerable over a period of a year or two, and then something happens that sounds trivial and there. And then, mm. I mean, is it as much about that as actually having the... I mean, Phil's talked about the skills of breaking bad news, well, fine. But in the end, when you've been in practice for a while, isn't it just about recognising that you're in a vulnerable state or other people recognising you might be? I think that's a really crucial point. And I think if we go back to the, the program that um, Walter Bell and Robert Buckman put together that was called On Being an Oncologist, that's basic premise was about teaching oncologists to sit down with their colleagues and say, I've had a really crappy day today. My job was really difficult today. And just touching into that vulnerability. Within our medical training, it's not something that's supported. We are supposed to be invulnerable. And I think this is where if we're providing routine support for staff, it's about training them to say it's OK to struggle. It's OK for this to be difficult. I, I think that's, <clears throat> that's really very important. But I also think, if we're near to the end, that we should consider some of the positive sides of this. And it always amazes me how well oncology staff in general do cope. And as I said at the very beginning, the sense of value and meaning in people's work is so high that it really does keep them going um, under very difficult um, circumstances. And on the whole, we do pretty well. Phyllis Lutman at the back here. Thanks. Oh, hi. Judith yes. Trotman, haematologist at Concord Hospital. I'd like to take that uh, comment from you, Phyllis, a little bit further and ask if there's been any research. We all talk about how drained, how emotionally draining our jobs are. But I also think we get a lot of great feedback and a lot of positive endorsement of all the work that we do when we work in the oncology field. How much do people measure that? Um, I personally believe that one of the things... This that is presumably non-Sydney Morning Herald feedback. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, one of the things I think we're particularly bad at is appreciating what we do, what we do for people. We tend to really focus on the grave and the, and the negative. Someone once said that um, happiness is like, is like silk. It just kind of rolls off you, whereas um, sadness is like um, Velcro. It just kind of sticks to you. And, and I think the same comes from if you're a health professional, you don't want to be seen to be boastful. You don't want to seem <coughs> to be, yes, I'm very good at what I do. You just want to do your job quietly. And, and lots of people thank you regularly. Thank you, um, I've done well. But as a surgeon, uh, if someone thanks me repeatedly, I kind of go, that's fine, don't worry about it. But the one complication I had four years ago still haunts me today, and it's like, you know, that's, that's, my, that's, what, that's my legacy. That's what defines me, which is wrong. Jerry Seinfeld said once, if you, if you get a good parking spot, take a moment, step back and say, <laughs> that's a good parking spot. Absolutely. Um, a related angle on your... Um the point is that um, we are wide up to uh, and a bias towards the negative, so we are more distressed by losing $5 than winning $20. And I think that's part of the, the problem you're addressing, that uh, we are so biased to looking at the problems and defining and focusing on the problems that we narrow our focus so exclusively and generate more distress about that, uh, and we miss sight of the fact that we've kicked a few goals today. And, and I think that's what I mean by knowing yourself as well, that uh, you need to understand those cognitive and physiological biases and uh, have a corrective or a way of catching them and, uh, and balancing out uh, how you see and understand and reflect on your day or what you've done or how you've done it. So, Judith, thanks for that question. So we can end on the point as let's cherish the parking spots and move forward. <laughs> I've got a free one. I, I am. <laughs> Please thank our panel.